Good morning, everyone. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Today, I want to um, address a couple things, and, and one of them is how it is that that these days there are lots of things that women frequently attend called women's Bible studies. And in these studies, women gather together to um, talk about things that they believe are in the Christian faith, but in fact are the doctrines and teachings of men or women, as the case may be. And sometimes when we as the sisters who are in Christ, so women who have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, and we who have received the Holy Ghost, even a measure of it, that sometimes we encounter such a situation. And it, it's a little bit tricky to know how to handle it. Now, first of all, uh, what I'd like to say is that when someone believes a lie, that most of the time they are very invested in believing that lie. And the reason that they're invested in it is because they are enjoying their sin. They don't want to have to be obedient to God's word. And this is particularly true these days. And I'm not picking in on anyone here. But it is particularly true these days in women that they don't want to sub submit themselves to the various ordinances contained in the Holy Bible regarding women, such as that a woman who... Uh, once she has been married, can, is not free to remarry unless her husband be dead. Or that women are commanded when they pray or prophesy to cover their heads. That women are commanded to be in subjection to their own husband and keep silence in the churches, not to take authority over men, not to teach men. And because of Luciferian feminism, so that the idea that women are oppressed by such things is a Luciferian idea. And because of Luciferian feminism coming into the churches, there are many people who want to kind of uh, fool around with the Word of God and try to say it doesn't mean what it says. When people do this, they fall under deception. Once a person tries to rationalize sin and and twist the scriptures in order to justify their disobedience. They will have delusion or blindness fall upon them. I've covered that in other videos, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that now. But I did want to make mention of that fact, because when we who are Christian women encounter religious women, that often what happens, for example, we might present them with Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the way of salvation, the way that someone becomes a Christian, and how we became a Christian. And of course, once we've done this, we do know, we, we, we know very strongly in our being that something amazing happened when we obeyed the gospel, and we felt our sins fall away from us. We knew that to be true. Of course, we want this for everyone, and, and we go forth into the world to, to tell people about it. And one of the things that can happen then is we encounter religious women who don't want to believe this. Now, whenever, in any situation, if you're talking to someone, say you're talking about a political situation, if you want to say, for example, that the wars conducted by the United States of America against other nations are unrighteous wars, and, and that, of a truth, what we're doing over there has nothing to do with American freedom or defending our freedom, but has everything to do with enforcing a globalist corporate agenda. If we point that out to people who have some investment in believing that, that that's not the case, so they're denying the truth. There's nothing that we can do to convince them. We can present them with, with evidence 
until, you know, next Tuesday. And they're not going to hear it because they don't want to. So we do need to know that going into situations where we're speaking the truth to people, that it doesn't matter if we present them with scriptures if they don't want to believe it. That said, in such situations, that doesn't mean that we're silent and we just go away and, 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 and don't ever speak the truth to such people. Because, in particular, in social situations such as um, women's Bible studies, that there might be women attending that gathering who will be able to hear the Word of God. And when someone can hear the Word of God, it's something that God put in them. It's not something that we do. Now, when we're talking about um, God's Word, one thing is particularly uh, poisonous in these days is that most people, the majority of people, believe some kind of delusion about salvation. So they believe that that saying a sinner's prayer is what makes them right before God, or making a decision for Christ, or believing in Jesus Christ, that, that these kinds of things have been put into people's minds as the way of salvation, when in fact nothing in the scripture says that. And I really mean that, nothing in the scripture says that. But what theologians will do is they will take certain passages of the Bible out of context and present them to people as irrefutable proof that these doctrines are true. So rather than to examine their lies, which I've done in other videos, I'd like to talk about what the truth is. Now, the first thing about the Bible that we need to know is that it's, it's a living thing. It's inspired by God, and there cannot be multiple translations of it. If we are Christians, we hold to the King James Bible, and that is because at a certain time in history, when the Roman Catholic Church would have um, been able to utterly kill all knowledge of God by destroying people's access to God's Word. At that time, at the time of the Reformation, God made a way for His Scriptures, His Holy Word, to be available to people. And this is complete. The King James Bible is complete. It's perfect. It's translated exactly right. There's no mistakes in it. There is nothing that should be in it that isn't in it. And when pe people doubt that, they, they quickly can be deceived then. Because theologians come along and say, well, this English is hard to understand. So what I'll do is I'll retranslate it for you and I'll I'll change the Word of God to make it easier to understand. But what happens is they end up changing the Word of God so it doesn't say the same thing anymore. Because the King James Bible was provided by God to his people so that we would have access to the truth, so we could actually know how to be a Christian, that is why it's really important to hold to God's Word, the King James Version of the Holy Bible, if you speak English. So we have to have that standard of truth. Otherwise, what, what the enemy will do is just present us with a translation that says something else and say that they're more intelligent than, than we are because they've uh, taken Greek and Hebrew and manipulated it. And that, that might be something that's an operation of intelligent people, but it's not an operation of wisdom. And and when people do that, they're doing it in order to twist the word, in order to get across a different agenda that's not God's agenda. If we go now to the book of John, chapter 11, and this is what I'm going to focus on today, is the concept that is widely taught in the churches these days, in the apostate churches, that belief alone is what saves us. So let's go to John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. 
And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Jesus said unto her, he's talking to Martha here, who is, her, her uh, brother has just died. So Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this. So this passage is used by theologians to confuse people and to tell them that belief alone will save them. Now we do know that the scripture in its entirety says something very different. But actually, these verses say something very different. I want to emphasize now, let's start with verse 26, and I'm going to emphasize a word here that most people just skip right over. And whosoever liveth, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this. So what does it mean to live in Jesus Christ? Well, to live in Jesus Christ means to, to obey him, to do what he said. If we go to John chapter 8, John chapter 8, and we'll read verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the truth makes us free. What truth was Jesus speaking of? He was speaking of the truth that we just read of in John chapter 11. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. When we believe Jesus Christ, we do what he says. And one thing that he says is that belief is not enough, that we also need to continue in his word. Then we are his disciples. The word disciple means it, it comes from the same root as the word discipline. When someone is a disciple of someone, what they do is they discipline themselves to do as that person did. It's a, a kind of following. So when we're disciples of Jesus Christ, we discipline ourselves to emulate him, to do as he did, but also to do what he said. One cannot be a follower or a disciple or a student of someone and go off on their own ideas about things. That, that might be some kind of path of education or learning something, but it's not being a disciple. People who are Christians hold to God's word because it's the only standard that we have. And that's why Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So when we read here, again, I'm just going to emphasize here, And whosoever liveth and believeth, liveth and believeth, in me shall never die. So to live in Jesus Christ means that our life is something that is following him, that is holding to what he said of a truth. If someone says they love Jesus Christ and, and want to be a Christian, how can that be true if they ignore what he says? That is not a demonstration of someone who is a disciple, someone who loves Jesus Christ. Let's turn now to the book of James, chapter 1, and we'll, we'll read verses 21 and 22. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Here the word of God tells us that 
The engrafted word is something that we received. And I'm going to cover in just a moment how the word is engrafted into a Christian. But for the sake of this part of the video, I want to focus on that when people don't obey the word, if they only hear it and don't obey it, they are deceiving themselves. Let's read on in verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. When we profess Christianity, and don't obey the principles contained in the scripture, we are religious hypocrites. We are people who want to, to know the things of God, but don't obey God. And this causes us to, to deceive ourselves. Now let's go. What I want to do um, now is I want, I want to address the issue of whether or not belief alone saves us. We have just read that the, receiving the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Well, what does it mean, the engrafted word? When we have a, a tree, in, in a tree that, that um, we want to graft something into, what we do is we, we cut something off of the tree and then put on a branch that comes from another tree. So it's a way of getting life to happen in something that comes from another place. And what this is applying to is the idea of sinners being made in the image of God by being grafted in to Jesus Christ. And we can read of this. It's found throughout the scripture. And, and really, this message is not for people who want to, to believe that belief alone is saves you. If you want to believe that, nothing that I say is going to convince you otherwise. This message is for Christian women who are going forth into the world and talking to other women so that we know how to present the truth because there are some people who will be able to hear it. And for that reason, we want to be firmly grounded in the truth of salvation and what the Bible says about how it is we are saved. So let's go now to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll read verses 20 and 21. And this is speaking of Jesus Christ. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God. So we, by Jesus Christ, believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that, that your faith and hope might be in God. Verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of incorruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So a Christian, the first thing that happens in a Christian, before they become a Christian, is that they are born again of God's word. In other words, when they hear God's word, they, they recognize that it's true and that it's, it, it's holy. There's something in people that, that divides right away. The, the word of God divides. We know that. So when we speak the word to people, when they can see the beauty of it and the truth of it, even if just a little bit, and it creates in them a desire to know more, this is being born of the word, someone who loves the truth. And, and then we read uh, in verses 24 and 25. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, 
and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So this is the everlasting covenant between God and men that he promised and foreordained. And, and so this was in God's plan for the world and something he knew would come into being at a certain time, the Son of God. And I'm going to repeat this now. Speaking of Jesus Christ, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So Jesus Christ had glory with his Father in his Father's idea of what he was going to do. So foreordained doesn't mean pre-existent. Jesus Christ did not exist for, throughout all eternity back forever with the Father. He is not a co-equal, co-eternal part of a triune Godhead. That is a Babylonian doctrine that has to do with Baal worship. Jesus Christ was foreordained. In other words, God knew the end from the beginning and was manifest in these last times for you. So in these last times refers to at a certain time, the Son of God was born of a woman into the world to bring salvation. And the everlasting covenant that God has made with people is that anyone who believes on the Son will have eternal life. When Jesus said, and let's just go back briefly now, to John chapter 11 and when he says here I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead shall yet live you see all humanity is dead without a savior we can't save ourselves from death but Jesus Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world to be a lamb to die for human sin. And anyone who believed on his gospel and obeyed it, only those who believe and obey get into the kingdom of God. Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we'll read verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I don't read anything in this verse that says that verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man believe on me and say a sinner's prayer or invite me into their heart or make a decision for me. Jesus didn't say that. He said that to enter the kingdom of God, we had to be born of water and of spirit. Now let's go to Mark chapter 16. So Mark chapter 16. I'm going to review for you here a number of scriptures that say that belief is not enough. And then you, as my sisters, when you encounter this sort of thing, you will be well equipped to be able to speak the truth. Maybe not for the person who's contending with you, but certainly for those who might witness the conversation, that, that it might raise questions in their mind and then who knows when that word might bring the word that you've spoken might bring forth fruit for the kingdom of God and verse 16 mark 16 we read he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved what is baptism let's go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and 39 and we'll just read very quickly here what the gospel is that Jesus commanded his disciples to preach and what it is to be baptized. There's two parts. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, this isn't being baptized in titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When Jesus said, when he commanded that his disciples baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that name is Jesus Christ. So repent and be baptized. So turn away from your sins and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, not as 
the outward sign of an inward change, not as a public testimony of your faith, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So baptism is water and spirit. Baptized in water for the remission of sins, and then receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost to dwell in you. Jesus said, if a man wants to enter the kingdom of God, he has to be born of water and spirit. This is the baptism that is Christian baptism. For the promise, verse 39 here, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. That's everybody. That's everybody who wants to get into the kingdom. Jesus didn't say that only certain people had to be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. He said that this was true of everybody. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now let's go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And again, we're focusing here on the idea, the mistaken idea, that it's enough to believe that faith alone saves us. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17. Of course, all of Hebrews 11 is a list of people who demonstrated their faith. But in particular, I want to use one example from this entire chapter. And there's a number of examples of people who did something to demonstrate their faith. We read in verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only son. You see, when we believe God, we trust him, and we do what he says even when it doesn't make sense. And that certainly was the case with our father Abraham, that when he heard the commandment of God to go up into the mountain and sacrifice his only son, he did that. He, he obeyed that, even though it seemed very contrary to everything that God had told him and promised him before that. He trusted God. And when we trust God, we do what he says. And when Jesus Christ tells us to do something, we trust him. So when he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, we trust that and we obey that. And when we do so, then we are not deceived. We have obeyed the word. We have not only heard it, but we have also obeyed it. Let's go now to the book of Titus, chapter 3, and we will begin with verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And what is that when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, that's when he manifested himself in his Son. So when God appeared as the Savior, capital here, Savior, when God manifested fully in his Son, that is when the kindness and love of God appeared to us. And then we, we read about salvation in the next verse. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So here in this passage, Savior is written twice, both times with a capital S. The first time is written as God, our Savior. The second time, as Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, how can this be? Well, it can be because God dwelled fully in his Son. God was manifest in the flesh. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So 
Jesus Christ had his Father dwelling in him, as Christians do, because we also have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in us. But I want to emphasize here, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. To, to say a sinner's prayer is a work of righteousness. It's something that we do. It's a work of the flesh. And anyone who has said such a prayer, if they have an honest heart, they will know that nothing happened, that they're still in bondage to sin. They still sin all the time. They, they are not clean before God. They have not be, been regenerated from anything. And yet the religious authorities tell them, oh, you're all set. God knows you're a sinner. You'll be righteous when you get into the kingdom. And this is simply a lie. We are regenerated when we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And again, that has two parts. First, our sins are remitted in the water of baptism. And second, we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the power of God dwelling in us so that we have the power to overcome sin. Now let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we'll read verses 11 and 12. In whom ye are circumcised. So this is about how Christians are cir circumcised in Jesus Christ. Pardon me, I lost my place. In whom ye are also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So it's a spiritual circumcision. In putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Well, what does this mean? What is the circumcision made without hands? What is the circumcision of Christ? Well, we just read the next verse. It says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So, again, we are buried with him in baptism. When we're immersed in the water, our sins are remitted the old man is dead and then we are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God what's that that's the Holy Spirit in us operating in us this is Christian baptism water and spirit Jesus said unless a man be born of water and spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God now finally I want to address the last little piece here that is commonly brought up and I, the reason I want to uh, bring it forward to you is that it's so commonly brought up that we would want to address it in this video so let's go to the book of Luke and chapter 23 many many people um, say well what about the thief on the cross so let's go and read about that Luke 23 and verses 42 and 43 and he said unto Jesus Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom and Jesus said unto him verily I say unto thee today shalt thou be with me in paradise so many people will say well the thief on the cross wasn't baptized he merely believed what we want to do is we want to understand that this conversation took place before Jesus Christ died for human sin he was speaking to a Jewish man and in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant the Jewish people only had to recognize their Messiah and believe on him why because they were already God's people the baptism of John was done so that people's sins would be remitted and that they could then recognize their Messiah so when this man on the cross recognized his Messiah we can see that most likely 
almost it's almost impossible to believe otherwise that at some point he had been baptized with the baptism of John because he recognized that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And he spoke to, to him thus, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Was Jesus in the kingdom of heaven that day? No, he hadn't been resurrected yet. Where is paradise? Paradise is in the center of the earth, or, or it was in the center of the earth. It was where faithful Jewish people, people who were godly people, went until Jesus Christ would come. And paradise is the place where, and, and when we read about Lazarus and the rich man, so there's a, a wide gulf between paradise and hell, and, or was, there was a white, white gulf there, and that righteous people, righteous Jews, went to paradise to wait for the Messiah. Let's turn to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and we will start in verse 28 and read through verse 30 to understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there are many places we could examine this from, but for the sake of this video, these are the words of Jesus Christ. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So we see that there's a distinction between those who get into the kingdom of God and those that were of the Old Testament up until the time of John the Baptist. So in order to enter the kingdom of God, one must be born of water and spirit. But Jesus says here, but I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. So John was there, to, he came to prepare the way of the Messiah for the Jewish people. So John only baptized Jewish people. It was for the remission of sins so that they would be able to see their Messiah. And we can understand this when we read the next verse. It says, But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So when Jesus came, before him went the spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist, who prepared the way of the Messiah by baptizing Jewish people for the remission of sins. And those who were baptized of John could then see their Messiah. And the reason for this is, is that baptism for the remission of sins takes the veil away from your eyes and you can see the truth. As long as you're in your sins, it's very hard to fully understand the truth of God. I would say it's impossible. One of the reasons why part of salvation is to have our sins remitted in baptism is so that we can see clearly, so that we're not seeing things through our own sin. Now, when Jesus said to the thief on the cross today, I will see you in paradise, what he meant was that the place where uh, people went before in the Old Testament, that Jesus would see him there. Not everyone who died before the Son of God paid for human sin went to hell. Righteous people, people who had the righteousness by holding to the law, that they went to a different place known as paradise and or Abraham's bosom. And that's where Jesus said that he would see this man because this man recognized his Messiah that Jesus said, you, you will see me there. 
the kingdom of God had not been established yet. That the, the way for people to be a Christian wasn't established until Pentecost. Let's turn to Acts chapter 1 and we'll read in verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, Jesus Christ was assembled with his disciples, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So the promise of the Father was the receiving of the Holy Ghost indwelling fully in his people as manifested by speaking in other tongues. And the New Testament did not begin the new covenant, the everlasting covenant that God made was to begin at Pentecost, not before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ our Lord. So we can understand that the thief on the cross was a Jewish man who recognized his Messiah. And for that reason, Jesus told him that he would see him in paradise. But the kingdom of God is different. The kingdom of God is the heavenly kingdom. And those who are Christians are, are waiting for that promise. And, and we have a different promise than than John the Baptist did and all the righteous men before him because we are being able to be brought into right relationship with God because of the crucifixion of Jesus. Before he was crucified, people were not yet redeemed and we have been redeemed. Let's go now to 1 Peter again, to 1 Peter and chapter 3 we'll start in verse 18 for Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit this hadn't happened at the time that Jesus spoke to the thief on the cross verse 19 by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. New Testament baptism is different than the baptism of John. The baptism of John was for the remission of sins so that the Jewish people could recognize their Messiah. New Testament baptism is by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we are, our sins are remitted, yes, but we also receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost dwelling in us because Jesus Christ has been resurrected. When we understand these principles, we know that it is not a mere ritual to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not something that we, we do because it, it, it's something that we do. It's when we obey that God does something in us. When a person gets on their knees and says a sinner's prayer, and I know because I did this before I was saved, nothing happens. Your sins are not remitted by apologizing to God. That's something that you're doing that comes from your own desire and your own effort to make amends to God. And it does not make amends for your sin. The only way to have your sins be, be washed from you is to obey the gospel and to be born of water and of spirit. So I hope this message has been a blessing to you, my sisters, who, who are going forth into the world and, and telling other women the truth of the gospel. That, again, I would say that, that 
when someone doesn't want to hear the truth, they won't be able to. But when we do this, we do know there will be some who will be able to hear, some who will love the truth, some who love Jesus, who, who hear the word and want to obey it. They're not going to want to make excuses for it. They're not going to want to be in rebellion and take a, a passage of scripture here and a passage of scripture there to deny the entirety of God's word. Because if there is ever a truth that is found in the Holy Scripture, it is the truth of salvation. It is found throughout the word in the Old Testament and in the New. It was prophesied in the book of Genesis and it continues all the way to the revelation of Jesus Christ at the end of the Bible. To, to not believe what God says and do it is evidence of someone who wants to have religious authority and credit for being a religious person, but is in rebellion and doesn't want to obey God. And we do know that, that to love means to obey. We don't love someone and then ignore what they want. When we read in John chapter 11, verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. To live in Jesus Christ and to believe in him means that we live according to what he taught. In John chapter 14, and we'll read verses 23 and 24, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So I hope that this message um, has clarified these things for my sisters who, who want to tell the truth to people. And I just encourage you to take heart, because many, many people, for whatever reason, cannot hear the word of God. And who knows, maybe that word will bear fruit at some later time. We can't know. It's not up to us. It's only up to us to sow the word, to sow the seed in people's hearts. And whether or not that seed breaks open and bears fruit in that person's life is up to God and not up to us. So we can confidently go forth and speak the truth of God's word, bringing scriptures to people, and not be discouraged when, for whatever reason, people don't want to hear it. Because when we do so, when we do these things, we are gathering for ourselves treasure in heaven, and our reward for our faithfulness will be great. You see, we don't get to always know how God is working in people's lives. As long as we do our part, then one day he will say to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of thy Lord.